welcome to episode 178 of the Various and Sundry Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Harmon, joined live from the Vault Studio on the beautiful campus of Grace College and Theological Seminary by my good friend, my colleague, my co-host, and the man who has graduated from growing grass to saving trees, John Scott Sloat. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Um, I learned over over the weekend. I have an endangered tree in my yard. Yeah, a a ash tree, like a white ash or a green ash. I'm not sure which, but mm-hmm. it has emerald ash borer, uh, mm. which is a plague uh, on the ash tree. So basically, these little bugs crawl underneath the bark and like pop the bark off, basically, mm. and bore into the limb and just eat the inside of the limb and it, it kills the tree. Hmm. And and what heroic measures are you taking to save the tree? So we bought a uh, like uh, uh, insecticide, what's called a systemic insecticide. My father-in-law taught me all about this. Yeah. Um, don't ask me for the actual uh, name <laughs> of the drug, but uh, basically poured it in a bucket, filled it up with water, poured it around the tree and it's supposed to like the roots are going to suck that up into the tree and it's supposed to get rid of the emerald ash borer. But I also spent a good chunk of the weekend uh, taking down dead limbs out of that tree, mm. uh, which is both exhausting and a little dangerous. Can be, yeah. Uh, and I still have one big one that's like leaning toward the house that I just didn't feel like I could take down myself. Yeah. Um, and then I uh, had my father-in-law come over to help me and we looked at him and I like, that's not a good idea for you and I <laughs> to, to do. So yeah. it's still there. OK. But needs to be taken down. OK. Yeah. Well, if you would like to get in, co- in contact with the show and get more tips about dealing with your own tree diseases, you can – It's really just the one tree disease. <laughs> you... And I don't know that I'm successful. OK. You can find us on Twitter <laughs> at VNS Pod. You can email the show, variousandsundrypodcast at gmail.com. We're on Facebook, we're on YouTube, and we would love for you to leave a five-star rating and a review. But you've never heard of Emerald Ashbor, have you? No, I haven't. You're one of the first people that haven't that I've spoken to. Really? I mentioned at the office, he goes, <laughs> oh, yeah, that stuff is terrible. Okay. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a bad bug. It's, it's not something I'm familiar with, yeah. yeah. It's one of these – you know how there's like – like kudzu in the south, like came mm-hmm. over on like a plane from Asia somewhere, and and yeah. now there's like like festering. This is the same thing with this beat with this bug with this emerald ash borer. Came over from Asia uh, somehow, um, showed up in Michigan, of course, of course, uh, and made its way, and is just killing off ash trees to the point where they're endangered. Hmm. We may lose the ash tree. Wow. Should we be doing something as a podcast to help? I mean, maybe. I mean. Maybe. Maybe a Save the Ash Tree Day or I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Use some of our substantial resources that we – the money we make from this podcast to invest in that cause. Yes. Okay. Well, speaking of the podcast, we are once again doing a marathon day of recording today Mm -hmm. because I will be gone. during. You're going back to Europe. I'm going back. Yeah. So when do you leave? Where are you going? What's the plan? So I leave June 5th. Um, that's ne- next week. Next Monday. Yeah. Uh, and my wife and I will be in Edinburgh, Scotland. Nice. For a few days. And then we'll head down to London for a few days. And then she will connect with a tour group that's coming through from the uh, Christian school that she teaches at. The, the, oh. They're doing London, um, Paris, and Barcelona. So okay. she'll connect with them in London and go off with them. And then I will head up to Cambridge and be at Tyndale House. Oh, nice. Writing and researching for the rest of that week. Nice. And so she's she is going on to Paris, yep. Paris and then mm-hmm. on to Barcelona. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I've been giving her a bit of a hard time because – um, there are so many chaperones on this trip. Like she, she and another adult are responsible for three kids. What? Yeah, exactly. My goodness. 
<laughs> and I'm like, so wait a minute. What are the ages I just, of these kids? I just led a trip where I was solely responsible for 13 college students. What are the ages of these? They're like juniors. Jun- uh, they just finished okay, their junior so they're year. Like, so they're late high school. They're getting to launch into uh, launching into co- being college students almost. Yeah. Yeah. My goodness. Yeah. It's, it's good work if you can find it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My goodness gracious. Yes. So anyway, that's why we had to record in addition to the episode, which today – we're actually recording today. It releases today. Oh, yeah. That's the right. holiday weekend. Yeah. Uh, we'll record two more. So um, we'll see if Sloat can endure. He uh, – you you were admittedly tired by the third one last time. That's right. This time though, we've taken a bit of a different approach. So yeah. it's like what ten thirty right now, something like that. Ish. Uh, we'll break for lunch. Yeah. I, I have a lunch at the local, the new local Italian place. Yeah. Um, so I don't know how the, and then we'll come back and record two more. Right. I don't know how two more episodes on a full belly of pasta <laughs> is really going to go. Yeah. Yeah, that'll be interesting. But you, you may hear a lot of apathy. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> whatever you says, fine, Matt. That's great. Yes. Yes, indeed. So, all right, John, you ready to talk some sports? Sure. So, we this is this will be the only episode we can talk sports in this marathon session because we won't know what's happening at that point. But yeah, uh, NBA finals are now set. The Nuggets, who it seems like they finished their series like three months ago. Well, last week, basically, yeah. uh, we'll be playing the Miami Heat, who nearly blew a three games to nothing lead. Yeah, I, we talked about this matchup a bit yeah. last week because mm-hmm. we were like, "Well, the Nuggets are in, and the Heat are up three nothing." So, yeah. which I mean, there's never been a comeback from three zero in the NBA. It's yeah. happened in baseball, it's happened in hockey, but never in the NBA. It's never happened in football. <laughs> yes, obviously. Um, <laughs> but uh, we talked about this matchup because we were like, yeah, it's probably going to be Nuggets, Nuggets Heat. And then the Celtics went on a run and won three and then yeah. lost game seven at home. By a substantial margin. Yeah, it wasn't super close. Did you see the end of game six on yes. Saturday? Okay. Yeah, I saw the, the highlights, obviously. Yeah. That was insane. That's one of the craziest endings I've seen um, with – Miami trailing the whole game, hitting three free throws with three seconds left. You're thinking, eh, they're probably going to win it. Yep. And then Boston gets the miracle of – after taking a terrible shot, the Keith, uh, Keith Smart. That's an Indiana player <laughs> from many years ago. Marcus Smart <laughs> takes this terrible three-point shot and – what is it? Uh, what's the kid – what's the guy's name? Is it White? I'm not totally sure, but he got the rebound. Crashes maybe. the boards and tips it in with like 0. 0.2 seconds left to and win the game. That was a well drawn up execution because if Jason Tatum was on the other side, like if the ball came off the other side, he was right there to yeah. to get the rebound and lay it in. But you just don't expect with that amount of time to be able to get a rebound opportunity. Mm-hmm. I mean with three seconds left, by the time you catch and shoot, the ball hits the rim and then comes off. That's about three seconds typically. Yeah. Or, or apparently in this case, it was like 2.8. Hmm. So um, who you got in the finals here now that they're set? Um, probably the Nuggets. OK. Mostly because I don't like the Heat. I can't stand the Heat. Uh, although – Though I don't like the Celtics either. So that Yeah, was... yeah. I don't care for the Celtics either. Um, yeah, I, I like the way Jimmy Butler plays. That dude is – Yeah, but he disappeared for like – Three games in that in the most recent. Like everyone's talking about how great playoff Jimmy is at, when they're up three zero, and then he disappears for like three games. Yep. It's like, oh, what happened to playoff Jimmy? The the big pl- uh, key for Miami last night was the uh, was uh, Caleb Martin. Hmm. He's come out of nowhere and been a substantial contributor. But so. I, I like the Nuggets. Who do you like? I like the Nuggets as well. Um, do you think the the rest the the month off hurts them at all? I think it can affect you maybe in game one. But um I think I think what offsets that is the altitude. Okay. The altitude advantage is significant, I think. Hmm. Um so we'll see. Um I, I think the nuggets in five or six. Okay. So that's my guess, hmm. which means that well, regardless of even to go seven, it'll be over by the time we actually record another live episode. Okay. Hmm. 
So we'll see. Uh, we should check in on your Mets. It's not. It's not been good. Anything else you want to say about that? You just want to move on. Uh, pitching has not <laughs> been not been good. Okay. We're giving up too many runs. Um, defense has been fine. The bats are coming to life a little bit, which has been fun. We've called up some youngsters. Uh, mm-hmm. We got this uh, this catcher named Francisco Alvarez. Uh, his nickname now he's 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 short and well built. Um, lacks kind of a neck. Uh, and they call him El Troll because um, he kind of looks like a troll. Mm. But has uh, he embraced this nickname? I think so. Okay. Uh, he only speaks Spanish, okay. you know, so so it's Who a little knows? it's a little hard yeah. to discern. But uh, the dude launched like three or four homers in the last week. He's batting three seventy five as a rookie. He's twenty one years old. <laughs> And uh, is a top five catcher right now in the league. So there you go. Uh, that that's been fun to watch. Okay. That's probably been the the biggest highlight of the season. It's been him and and some other youngsters on the team. All I've right. Dead. Good to know. Good to know. But the team is bad. Like it's, it, the pitching has been real bad, and it's going to have to get a lot better. All right. Anything else in the sports world that I've missed here? <sighs> trying to think. Indianapolis five hundred was this weekend. I don't even know who won. Do you? No, I just know. I just know. I saw a lot of pictures from it. Okay. Uh, I guess I don't even know that they ran the race. I assume they did. <laughs> you but just I, saw pictures of. People I just there. saw pictures of of people at the uh, yeah. at the race. You know who's a regular there? Is our athletic director? Yep. Yep. He Every was year. one of the, one of the one of the photos I saw there. Yep. And our president was there. This. Yep. He this was week. there as well. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. Another another photo. Just to be clear, the president of Grace College, not. President of the United States. Yeah, yeah. I want to make sure that contextual reference yep. is there. Yeah, yep. Very different people. Yes, <laughs> that's true. That is true. All right, you ready to move on? Yeah. So it is time for us to have our first installment of discussing our summer read: How to Find Yourself Why Looking Inward Is Not the Answer by Brian Rosner. So we had suggested that people read. Uh, part one, which is five chapters. Um, so we'll in the introduction, sp- yeah, we'll spend which, s- which is short. Yeah, we'll spend some time talking about that before uh, moving on to our other main topic for the day. So, um, so really, this this part one, he has uh, labeled it as looking for yourself, um, and so five chapters in there, looking inward. A Collective Identity Crisis, Five Tests of the Good Life, Ancient Texts and Modern Preoccupations, and Looking Elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So um, you want to start with general impressions of these five chapters? You just want to dive right into chapter by chapter and kind of hit some highlights. So because we're recording three episodes today, we have like almost the whole book read at this point. I finished it yesterday. Uh, (laughs) One of of the fun – one of the the interesting – uh, things that I notice is like this this guy is Australian. Mm-hmm. Uh, and some of his references, I'm like, I know nothing about that. Yeah. And, and he just sort of drops it in there. Like I, yep. And after some like Googling, I realize, oh, this is something that happened in Australia. That's right. That's uh, right. So, so it's, it's fun to read the book from like, oh, this has an Australian lens to it, yeah. if you will. And that, that's been a lot of fun to read. Yeah. Also been listening to the audiobook of him and uh-huh. he's got a sweet accent. He does. Yeah. And we have locked him in for an interview. Great. So, end will, uh, end of when, when, when will that drop? Uh, that should drop. It'll be the episode that drops on June 27th. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Which it's crazy hard to schedule that because of the 14-hour time difference. Yeah, we're recording that like what? 7 o'clock at night? 7 o'clock at night, which is like 9 in the morning. Yeah. I mean the we're, next day we're bumping him. into bedtime. Uh, <laughs> I know. Hair mask. You might need an extra cup of coffee to be awake. We'll, we'll see. Or who knows? Maybe maybe, I'm, maybe I'll be bubbly and yeah. bouncing off the walls. Yeah. OK. So um, I, I, I'm, I was a little surprised. I was waiting for you to to – to mention the fact that he uh, he quotes two of your favorite people, he does regularly. Uh, uh, yes. Now, one of the one of them he quotes regularly in part two, uh, but uh, Tim Keller and David Brooks, yeah. he quotes all the time. Yeah, 
I'm like, oh gosh, this just warmed Sloat's heart right here. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I did feel my heart strangely warmed. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. So let's let's start with chapter one then. Okay. Uh, looking inward. Um, and so it's – he starts off with a little bit of his own story um, but uh, – which he weaves throughout the book really. But really chapter one is um, – it, it kind of orients you to uh, his take on what's become a somewhat common expression of expressive individualism. Which is really what the whole book is about is this. Yes. It uh, is a critique of expressive individualism. Mm -hmm. Uh, and he provides a nice little summary on page 24 here uh, of seven points that summarize it. The best way to find yourself is to look inward. Mm -hmm. The highest goal in life is happiness. All moral judgments are merely expressions of feeling or personal preference. Forms of external authority are to be rejected. The world will improve dramatically as the scope of individual freedom grows. Everyone's quest for self-expression should be celebrated. And then lastly, certain aspects of, per, of a person's identity, such as their gender, ethnicity, or sexuality, are of paramount importance. Mm -hmm. So that's his summary. Um, that's not unique to him. I mean there's been plenty of critiques of expressive individualism. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the foremost obviously is the book – is the work of Carl Truman who uh, wrote, wrote the forward. forward to this. Mm -hmm. So um, – yeah. And, and yeah, I believe Brian Ross even says, well, I wanted to quote The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. Unfortunately, it came out too late uh, for yeah. me to be able to, to snag it. Yeah. Um, one thing that I did uh, note about the, uh, the the opening chapter here is he, he, he goes out of his way to try to emphasize there, there are some benefits to mm -hmm. looking inward. So he's not saying – there is no place at all for looking inward to understand who we are. Right. And I think that's important because you know you could easily swing to the extreme of of thinking, well, you should never look inward. Mm -hmm. Well, no, there's there's a component to that. Self-reflection. Yeah. I mean, he goes out of his way to mention that self-reflection is a really good thing. Yeah. Uh, even alluding to, I can't remember if it's in this chapter or the next, but talking about you know Socrates uh, about the mm -hmm. examined life. Uh, those are all. Good and admirable, admirable uh, aspects of looking inward. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one nice feature of this book, uh, he provides questions for reflection and discussion at the end of each chapter, mm -hmm. which I think are really good. Um, but probably in the interest of time, we should move on to the second chapter here unless you had something you were desperate. Nope. Second chapter, Collective Identity Crisis. Um, this is more of a sort of analysis of how this form of expressive individualism has taken over our culture and become something that is so prevalent that um, it's uh, it's assumed. It's just sort of a given that people don't even reflect upon until pressed, so to speak. Um, but uh, I thought one thing that was really helpful uh, on page 34 um, – he basically said – let's see. Uh, my view is that by advocating so strongly for looking only inward to find yourself, expressive individualism is a major contributor to the prevailing identity confusion and instability. Mm -hmm. So he's putting the, uh, the blame right there. Um, and then he, he talks about different elements of a person's identity. He kind of talks about 10 common uh, or traditional identity markers, which I think are helpful. Um, what are some things that stood out to you in this chapter here? Well, uh, he really highlights uh, toward the start of the chapter that even though you know we, we have this constant culture of looking inward, looking at ourselves, uh, we have an unprecedented, unprecedented number of people who claim to not know themselves, yeah. uh, that, that they don't know who they are. Uh, yeah. And, and at, at the end of the chapter, which um, I, I think he leans on, uh, I think it's Charles Taylor for this. Uh, that a, a number of people that constantly look inward are, are actually quite fragile mm -hmm. uh, and quite uh, quite brittle uh, yeah. people, which which I've seen. You know, you oh, know, yes. um, you know. I, I think it's important to point out that even though we work and uh, live in a very Christian community here uh, on a Christian campus, 
these things pop up in the classroom all the time. Oh, all the time. Uh, and so just because somebody is uh, politically or theologically conservative, they're not, uh, they're not immune uh, to some of these things as 100%. well. 100%. Uh, particularly when he talks about uh, people being fragile. Um, yes. That's something that we've seen. And, and we've talked about this a little bit on the podcast before in terms of uh, some of the work that Jonathan Haidt has done in terms of yeah. – who he quotes later on yeah. in, the, in the book, not yeah. here. But. And even all the, you know, how how regularly do we use the term safe? Mm-hmm. This is a safe space. And I'm not saying that there's never a place for talking about using that term. But the prevailing uh, assumption that the classroom should be a safe place, meaning typically what is meant by that is that I should never be made to feel uncomfortable mm-hmm. about who I am, what I believe, or how I feel, Mm -hmm. that that's just illegitimate. I should never be made to feel uncomfortable or challenged that you could be wrong. Yeah. I I remember being in a a small group Bible study with a group of students years ago and uh, sort of challenging one young person's assumptions Mm -hmm. uh, in this like – Hey, you know that that seems to be more derived from your feelings than than from the text. Yeah, you know, you know, uh, and I I remember saying that, and you know, it it's possible I said it more aggressively than I remember. You know, you know, uh, these different things. I remember being called out by another student in the group, like, why would you say that to them? Hmm. Why would you do harm to them? That was, yeah. that was sort of the the yeah. the verbiage. I was like, no, I'm just I'm just making a point. Uh, you know, right. Uh, no, I, I don't mean to call them. Well, come to find out, this person felt like they could no longer trust me or or talk to me, and and did not talk to me for six or eight months wow. or something like that. Um, so yeah, that the the fragile component mm-hmm. of that rings very true to me. Yep. Uh, chapter three, he gives five tests of the good life, and this this is something that he comes back to throughout yes. the book. Uh, yep. It's like, how does this narrative and worldview? Handle these five things. Yeah. Yep. So those five are how it handles uh, suffering and disappointment, how it handles pride and envy, how it handles the existence of weak and lowly people, Mm -hmm. how it handles enemies and injustice, and then how it handles happiness and pleasure. And basically after working through that, um, the the final grade he gives for expressive individualism is a big fat F. Yep. Yep. Um, that's a good chapter. I, I encourage. I, I, I couldn't. I can't resist mentioning this one. This little nugget here. This is not surprising to me at all. But what page, John? Um, this is bottom of forty-three. Uh, this is taken actually from your boy David Brooks. Uh, David Brooks reports that in a recent survey, around ninety-six percent of eighteen to twenty-nine-year-old Americans agree with the statement. I am certain that someday I will get where I want to be in life. And then he continues, this is the kicker. In 1950, a personality test asked teenagers if they considered themselves an important person. 12% said yes. By the late 1980s, 80% said yes. We've cracked the 90s now, haven't we? If you did Uh, that survey today, if, if you ran that survey... On on the on a, on a typical college campus or in a high school, we'd crack ninety, wouldn't we? Yeah, I mean, we do some we do some testing uh, of every freshman class that comes in, and and we do it in concert with uh, national right. research with UCLA. Yeah, and uh, one of the things that comes back on ours is like ninety five percent of our students think they're going to graduate with with a four point GPA. <laughs> yeah. Um, yep. And you want to know what? That's not I always happen. laugh at that. Yeah, uh, yeah. Because it's it's not true, no. or sh- at least even with it, great inflation, even with great happening. inflation, it's not that true. Yeah. yeah. Uh, chapter four deals with personal identity and the Bible. So um, it kind of comes back around to that. So I'm going to jump over that to to chapter five, looking elsewhere. Um, and I thought this was really helpful in terms of thinking about identity. He summarizes it as we look around. Meaning that it, they're the people around us, community, people who know us, as well as looking backward and forward, backwards to our history mm-hmm. uh, and forward to our hopes. Yeah. Um, I think that's a really good – and then he adds, we look upward. Right. So that's a really good 
uh, way of, I think, conceptually grabbing some of that, uh, of the complexity of identity formation. And he goes on to explain that later on. Yeah. Uh, and that's, I, I find the, those things really helpful, like yeah. that framework, uh, putting that together for us. Yeah. We well, need to, we, we need, need to move on. We need to move on. But uh, for next uh, for next week, uh, read part two, which is only chapters six and seven. So a little, little more condensed there. Yeah. But. Or if you're us an hour later. Right. All right. It's time for us to move on to our other main topic, and that is the legacy of Timmy K. Tim Keller. Yeah. Are you going to be able to get through this without tears? I don't know. OK. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, I, I don't know that I've ever received more condolence text, uh, <laughs> than the day he yeah. passed away. Um, yeah. well, what's crazy is he, we were flying back to the States from my trip Yeah. and I saw the tweet that basically said he's going into hospice. Like, okay, he's going to yeah. pass away. So that was like at the airport in Brussels. We land like nine hours later and it's like. He's passed away. Mm -hmm. like, whoa. It that, was very quick. That happened very quickly. So, Yeah. Pa pancreatic cancer is – It's nasty. It's uh, virtually a death sentence. Yeah. It's, it's difficult. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of different ways. Why don't we just start personally, John, with um, what are some of the ways that Tim Keller has been influential in your life? Why don't you start and then I'll cry? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I think uh, – now, I am not um, – I, I, I admire Tim Keller immensely. I'm not at the same place you are in terms of like mm -hmm. he would be – You know, I know for you he's one of the probably one or two most influential Christian thinkers that's formed how you mm -hmm. think about the Christian life. He doesn't reach that status for me, but I still admire him immensely. Mm -hmm. um, but I think uh, for me, his ability to identify idolatry, both culturally and individually, mm -hmm. and then apply the gospel to it is probably one of the um, most significant influences on me in how I think about uh, preaching mm -hmm. and even in my own life of spiritual growth of understanding how idolatry works and then learning to apply the gospel to it. So when I when I think of of Tim Keller, that's probably the first thing that comes to my mind as a that's how he's helped me. Yeah. Uh in my walk with God. Yeah. Uh yeah, like like you said, I think Tim Keller's probably the most formative thinker that's helped me put my Christian life together. Mm -hmm. Um yeah. a thinker and writer. Uh his book Prodigal God, mm -hmm. counterfeit gods, um, yep. um, as well as some some lesser known ones, uh, the uh, uh, freedom of self forgetfulness. That's like a little booklet almost. That's like isn't forty it? pages, yeah. yeah. And it's basically one of his old sermons put in print. Uh, yeah, I, I remember coming to the Gospel Coalition. What was the year? Um, it was in Chicago, and it was preaching Christ in the Old Testament. Yeah, that was – oh, goodness. So Gospel Coalition is odd years. Um, so my guess is that would have been like 11, 2011. Yeah, yeah that sounds right. Um, and and I remember I was first, second year seminary student, green as can be, um, and trying to – uh, piece together like how do I think about Christ and all of Scripture, mm -hmm. uh, and how do I think about ministry, broadly speaking. Uh, and I remember at that time I was working with a student who was an an artist as well. I was meeting with them regularly on campus as part of my mm -hmm. part of my role and responsibility here at Grace. And I'm thinking like how does the gospel kind of speak into their life? And I remember going to that conference and hearing Tim Keller. As far as I recall, it's the first Tim Keller sermon I heard and. Um, the day he passed away, I made Andrea sit down and, and watch it on YouTube with me. Was that the Exodus 14? One? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That was Exodus 14 uh, in preaching about getting out. Um, and I'll never forget him talking about like it, it is the uh, object of our faith uh, that saves us, not the mm -hmm. quality of our faith and yeah. talks about the Israelites going there. And I just had never heard anybody unpack the Old Testament that way before. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and so going back and hearing other things, his, his uh, gospel-centered ministry, uh, his focus on cities uh, has, has been very formative for me. And then um, pro- probably the final piece is, you know, I'm, I'm from New York. I'm from Long Island. No, really? Yeah. I don't know if listeners Has know that. Has that come up on the show? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm, and, uh, you know, there, there's – there is there is like a weird – I don't know if people in the Midwest really understand this. Well, I think people from Ohio probably would. That there's a weird pride with New York City mm-hmm. uh, and like – like I, to illustrate this, I remember going to a fort in Florida – and uh, it was like a Civil War era. It wasn't super used a ton during the Civil War. And it was like, well, you know, the, the guide's telling us like, well, this group of people tried to build the fort. They couldn't really finish it. This group of people then came in. They couldn't finish it. And then the militia from New York came in and it was done like that. <laughs> and I remember my dad leaning over to me. And I couldn't have been more than 14, maybe, maybe 13. And my dad leaned over to us. That's because New Yorkers get things done. <laughs> See that? It's true. Yeah. Uh, and there's just like the, the weird yep. pride and sure. uh, it, it breaks my heart that uh, so few of them are Christians. Mm-hmm. And just the fact that his ministry was centered right there, yeah. uh, right there in the heart of the city uh, and reached a lot of secular people uh, with the gospel uh, warms my heart. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, – that was probably uh, – <laughs> And, you know, one thing that's striking about – Tim Keller is in 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 a, in a time and a place where there's been so much discussion about celebrity pastors. Mm-hmm. He never pursued that. And when you look at like how old he was when his first book was published, he was in his forties. Yeah, like he was not he was not one of these like, uh, and this is not intended as a slam, but you know he wasn't like a Matt Chandler. A yeah. young guy who just kind of bursts on the scene. You're like, oh my gosh, you're a big deal now. Yeah. Um, you know, he had been a he he had been a small town rural pastor in Virginia, mm-hmm. then moved to the big city, um, and had had a long sustained ministry in New York before anybody outside of a very small circle of people had ever really heard of him. Mm-hmm. Um, Obviously, one of his lasting legacies will be his partnership with Don Carson to form the Gospel Coalition. Oh, absolutely. And um, – As well as I think his writing ministry. Yeah. Um, yep. You know, I, I, I think his books, a good number of them I think will – will uh, They'll well, still be read many years from now. Yeah, yeah. Or, or they'll go through a season of being forgotten and rediscovered potentially. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So have you read the Colin Hansen intellectual biography of – I have not. I'm stunned um, by this. Well, you know, it's I, been out since like February, I think. I pre-ordered it like a year in advance. Yeah, and I got an email from Amazon the day it came out, like, "Hey, we ran out of copies, and you didn't make the cut." It's basically the email I got from Amazon. <laughs> no. um, that had to be crushing. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I haven't, I haven't purchased it yet. Uh, I'm planning on it for vacation. Is sort okay. of what I'm thinking. But uh, probably the big have you do you have a copy of it? I no. don't. No. Um, the one anecdote I've heard from it is that Tim Keller taught himself to read at three years old. <laughs> okay. <laughs> which which just makes you go like, he's built a little different. Yeah. You know. Yeah, for sure. Um, for sure. But yeah, I, I have not read it. Yeah, I have not. Uh, I have not either. It's on my list of something I uh, cer- certainly want to read. Um, I have heard Colin Hansen do a few interviews about it. So, um, I have to. I, I've listened to a few. So, out of his books, you mentioned a few. You mentioned Prodigal God. You mentioned um, Counterfeit Gods. Um, you know, another uh, way that his influence will be felt long after he has just passed away is uh, his involvement in the New City Catechism. Mm, yeah. Um, that is something that I think will have a profound long-term effect as different churches and just parents and others use it in the church as a way of catechizing um, the next generation in the faith. Yeah. So um, in fact, there's an, there's even an app now that's mm-hmm. connected with that where you can walk through that. Um, his preaching book is very good as well as you'd expect. Um, 
trying to see his what his if you want to get a framework for her, like how he thought about ministry and how how he thought about those things his book center church mm-hmm. uh probably reads more like a textbook yeah. than anything yeah uh but is is just fascinating like i I'll, I'll never forget uh the moment and maybe this is youthful arrogance uh when when i thought to myself like oh i could i could probably do this and then i read like Here's the list of things that Tim Keller's reading uh, outside of Bible commentary, sermon prep. He goes, mm-hmm. well, you know, I read these 30 publications uh, as well as blogs and, and things like that. And I was yeah. just fun, like, I, I, can't, I can't do that. No. Um, so – but he's like, yeah, I, every copy of The Atlantic I pick up, I find a mm-hmm. uh, sermon illustration of some kind. I went, yeah. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure? Yeah. But anyway, um, his prayer book also um, been helpful. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, and just as time has gone on, I think a lot of his personal devotion has come out as well, like like his personal habits. Uh, he prayed through the Psalms monthly, uh, mm-hmm. so made his way through the entire Psalter every month uh, and did that for 25 years. Yeah. And that's uh, – I I started out the year trying to do that, made it through I think twice by April, and went I I can't pull this off. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, he's a uh, a wildly uh, and wildly devoted and mm-hmm. uh, consistent person. Yep. And and I also appreciated um, the fact that even though he was a big deal, like he went out of his way to try to avoid. All the trappings of the celebrity culture that is easy to, you know, just sort of be pulled into. Um, arguably, one of the clearest ways is that even though his network of churches that he helped plant, the Redeemer Network, he has, I think there's like five different ones in and around New York City area. I think hmm. I think there's five. Um, he would preach at the different ones, but they would never announce in advance. That's right. Yep. Where he'd be preaching. You just had to show up and, and, and hope. hope. Yeah. Also, that was the first time I'd ever been in a Presbyterian church. And so I just walked in with Dunkin' Donuts coffee oh. and just walked right in and sat down and just continued to drink my coffee and then saw in the bulletin that that's a big no-no. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so I appreciated that. And I also know he he is very – he's been – he was very reluctant to take pictures with people or to sign autographs mm-hmm. and do things like that. Um, which, you know, there was a I, I forget who maybe it was in a Colin Hansen interview, but he was telling the story of, of, of there was a uh, both Keller and Driscoll were preaching in the UK, not at the same venue, but not far apart within a, f- a couple of weeks of each other. And so one individual in the UK went to hear them both, and he said he was struck by the fact that after after Driscoll was done preaching, he was taking pictures with people and signing stuff and it felt very celebrity-ish. After Keller got done preaching, he spent a long time just answering people's questions. Mm. No pictures, no like we assigned – just like interacting with people. And, yeah. Um, and he just said that was very striking in terms of that. So um, yeah, I mean I think uh, it's fair to uh, to note that Probably over the last 10 years of Keller's life here, uh, and this is just a reflection of the state of evangelicalism, that some became more critical of, of Tim Keller and his approach to ministry in New York City mm-hmm. um, as well as his approach to kind of cultural apologetics and those sorts of things. Um, though I, I, I will note one of his more there, – there's been a, a guy named James Wood who's been a relatively – firm critic of some of his cultural engagement kind of stuff. Uh, and yet when when Keller died, he wrote a very glowing like, mm. here's what I appreciate about Tim Keller. You all know that I have disagreements with him about this. And it just reminded me, John, like we've just lost our ability to do that. Mm-hmm. It's just so rare that we can't say about somebody, I, adm- I appreciate, I admire, I like these you know, handful of things about this person. But I disagree with them about these one or two things mm-hmm. or even these three or four things. Like our culture has just lost its ability to say, yes, I, I like these and I can appreciate this person for yeah. these contributions 
while at the same time saying, I think they were wrong about this. And that's actually kind of a big deal that I think mm-hmm. they were wrong about this. We've just lost the ability to do that. Yeah. That's unfortunate. Mm-hmm. But are you ready to move on? Are there more things you want to um, say about Emotionally Tim or in the podcast? Uh, well, either. <laughs> Let's move on in the podcast. <laughs> OK. I don't know that I'll ever move on emotionally. <laughs> yes. Yes. I'm just kidding. Um, yes. All right. Well, we should move on to this day in sports history. All right. This day in sports history, May 30th, 2023, 1911. Uh, it, the first Indianapolis 500. Uh, Ray Haroon uh, drives a Marmon Wasp for <laughs> Nordyke and Marmon Company comes out of retirement with inaugural event. Average speed was 74 miles an hour. I put that in there because it had fun names for you to pronounce and because I wanted to note, note the speed. Yeah. 74.6. I do, I do 74 miles yeah. an hour now. Um, <laughs> How did I do on the names? Did I, did I do all right? Sure. OK. Uh, maybe I'm getting better at this. Uh, 1927, Walter Johnson records his 110th and final shutout of his uh, Baseball Hall of Fame career, uh, the most in MLB history. Washington Senators score 3-0 in the win over the Red Sox. Yep. There's a record that will never be broken. Um, let's see. 1970, uh, Tigers' Al uh, uh Kaline. K-Line. K-Line collides with another player and swallows his tongue. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I, so I was – I, mean, I assume that means he like bit through it and then – I have no idea. The chunk went down his – It doesn't say dislodged his tongue. So maybe maybe it was still attached and he swallowed it backward. I don't Is know. that possible? I don't know. My goodness. Um, I mean, your, your wife's in the medical field. She might be able to explain yeah, She does drugs though. She <laughs> doesn't do tongues. Um, 1971, Willie Mays hits his 638th home run, sets NL record uh, of 1,950 runs scored. Okay. Willie Mays. Uh, 2009, uh, Super Rugby Final. Oh, boy. Um, uh, Pretoria Mor- Mornay Stein – Kicks five conversions and two penalties as the Bulls thumped the Chiefs uh, in uh, New Zealand, 61 to 17. Yeah. Did you understand any of that? I mean the kicks part. Um, but... I know that once you score, you kick. I imagine right. that's what they're talking about. Yeah. You get like an extra point. Yeah. Um, but I think that's what they're talking about. OK. And two penalty kicks I imagine as well. Sure. Yeah. I don't. But I imagine in a thumping like 61 to 17 that there was some good fouls going on. Sure. Sure. All right. Who do you like out of that list? Oh, boy. Um, uh, maybe Walter Johnson, 110th uh, shutout of his baseball Hall of Fame. But did we do, didn't we do something with him and shutouts recently? I don't remember. Um, um, How about we go with Al Kaline swallowing his tongue? That sounds great. I mean, what a horrific – I assume he died. Way to go. He did um, not die. No? <laughs> he did not. <laughs> All right. One thing you liked. Uh, one thing I liked. I have been reading through uh, since Tim Keller's passing his re- uh, Rediscovering Jonah uh, book. Um, hmm. It has every earmark of Keller, thoughtful, great work with um, uh, literature and weaving that in and Okay. Keen observations of the text. So, all right. Yeah, rediscovering Jonah by Tim Keller. There you go. Uh, I'm going to go with a true crime podcast that my wife and I listened to over the weekend as we were on the road. Um, we listened to a podcast called "The Girl in the Blue Mustang." Nice true crime podcast. Um, has some nice twists in it. So I'll hmm. spoil that for you. But and it's only like six episodes. Is it all available? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Oh, I, like, got some, I got some travels. It's like up. six episodes, and it's uh, most episodes are between thirty to forty minutes. So okay, nice. To, it's easy to crank through in a, yeah. in, a, in a reasonable road trip. So, all right, we have talked about trees. We've talked about NBA finals. We've talked about Brian Rosner, how to find yourself, and uh, reminder: read part two for next episode. That's chapter six and seven. We've talked about the legacy of Tim Keller, and John Slow made it through without openly weeping. So, well done. <laughs> Privately, though. Yes. Um, uh, we talked about Al, Al Kaline swallowing his tongue. We talked about uh, re 
Discovering Jonah by Tim Keller and a podcast that I've enjoyed over the weekend. So by definition, we have covered our various and sundry topics. And all that's left to say is, until next time, the Lord bless you all real good. Later. Later.